My name is Chris Greeley. I'm a pediatrician at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. I research um, the prevention and recognition of child abuse, mostly physical abuse and mostly uh, injured babies and brain injuries in babies. And so we have a panel today to discuss some of the ideas and programs around preventing abuse particularly physical abuse and neglect in babies. And I wanted to start by framing our understanding of prevention and giving you a couple of slides just on prevention in general. And then we have an expert panel of people who are involved with developing and rolling out of programs helped to, uh, intended to help support families and young children. And so historically, prevention of child abuse was targeted towards the child and that the, the child was broken or bad and children were locked away and we hear the ideas of street urchins in the 1800s and early 1900s and that the problem with abuse was that the kid just was not made properly and it was their fault. And prevention was recognizing the bad seeds and getting rid of them. In the early part of the 1940s and 1950s, there was a real change to look at the perpetrator themselves, and it was looking at the, the parent mostly, or people, and we have the idea of old men in trench coaches in the street corner beating up kids and abusing kids, and it was something that they were wrong, that there was some psychopathology, that they were broken in some way. And really how we've come to today is that we've viewed prevention in a very different light, and we view it now as a symptom of larger societal either imbalances or illnesses or problems within societies, communities, and families. And so most of us are familiar with the idea of primary, secondary, tertiary prevention, which is you know, going before something happens, decreasing the effects of something, or ameliorating things after it has happened. And really, I want to reframe this for you in how prevention really is being thought of now, reframing it to a population level approach. And if we think of population level, there are certain key, key features that are really, really important. One is primary prevention, meaning prevention before abuse would have happened, or even the risk factors of abuse have started to develop. It's population focused, not on an individual person, but on a community or a group of people. Lots of disciplines, it's not just a doctor or a psychiatrist or a social worker or a nurse, it's a collaborative efforts, lots of actions, and really one of the hallmarks of modern prevention is one of the challenges, which is monitoring and assessing whether it works or doesn't work, and that really becomes a big challenge, and we'll talk about some of that today. All of this stems from the idea that young kids live in a really complicated world. They have issues themselves, their families may have issues, their neighborhoods may have issues, the society they live in may have issues. And this is Webb, what has been described in the past as an ecological theory. All of these things either are risks or protective factors for young kids. And I want to reframe prevention along a different continuum and not just really primary, secondary, and tertiary, but for, it's in quadrants. So if we think of prevention, we think of responses to bad things, we can either be reactive or we can be preventative or proactive. It can be to a lot of people, a collective, or it can be to individuals. So what we really want to be in prevention is, for a lot of people, proactive or preventative. And the goal is to be in that top quadrant, not what we see most of the time, which is you know, reactive in individual as crisis or therapy sessions, re reactive but collective or food banks or helping homeless shelters, things like that. Preventative individual, our individual's counseling and skill sessions. And what we really want to be is that top corner. We want to be helping communities, helping infrastructures, developing networks, helping creating safety nets that are pro proactive and preventative and for a larger group of people. And the goal of the, some of the programs and for your consideration is to sort of think through in this network of being proactive and, and preventative and helpful for larger families, how do they fit? And we look at what are the, what we call, what I call the cake of well-being. There are, there are child protective factors or things about the child that make it 
easy. There are things about the family that make things better. There are things about the community that are protective. And there are things about society in general that are protective. And we have to balance those against some of the risk factors. And the risk is there may be child issues. The child may have colic. The child may have uh, uh, birth defects. The child may be medically fragile. The child may have just a bad temperament. There are family issues that can be risk factors to the child. There are community factors such as access to, to health care or uh, child care. And then there are societal issues where there's injustice, inequality, and imbalances. And so prevention of child abuse, these balances between increasing the protective factors from child, family, community, or society, and decreasing the risk factors. And some of these programs uh, um, are geared towards that, or these programs are geared towards some of these areas. And there's not one solution, there's not one answer to child abuse. It is a patchwork addressing individual community and family needs. And so that's for your consideration. I'm going to start with Sarah Dzinski, who will tell a little bit about herself while I get her slides together. Let's see. I think I'm actually going to use this. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? No? no? Let's try that one. How about now? Better? All right. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as Dr. Greeley said, I'm Sarah Dzinski. I work at Dell Children's Medical Center in Austin, Texas. Um, I work in trauma services um, as a research scientist and a child abuse prevention specialist. Um, this is our facility. We are a member of the Seton family of hospitals. We, are, uh, we have over 15 hospitals and clinics in the central Texas area, including two level one trauma centers, and Dell Children's is one of those trauma centers. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk with you about abusive head trauma. Um, when those cases come in, they come into our hospital. They come into our trauma service. Um, we treat them. And I can tell you, in the past 10 years, we've treated about 240 cases of abusive head trauma in our trauma service. And that averages about two cases per month. And as someone who... Um, sees these cases regularly, that's two cases per month too many. Um, so what is abusive head trauma? Um, basically, it can be caused by direct blows to the head, by dropping, throwing, or shaking a child. And now let's talk about shaken baby syndrome. Um, Actually, just an FYI, the medical community kind of now prefers the term abusive head trauma as an umbrella term. Shaken baby syndrome is a form of abusive head trauma, and it occurs when a baby is shaken and held by the torso or the shoulders or the arm, most commonly the torso, because you see accompanying rib fractures that come with that. But it can also be um, with impact to the head with or without shaking. So let's talk about shaking as a mechanism of injury. Um, a child, an infant brain is very soft. And so when you shake an infant, their brain is actually kind of pounding against the skull itself. And in seeing perpetrator uh, reenactments, videotaped perpetrator reenactments, the shaking motion looks something like this. So you can imagine the head whipping back and forth. Um, the neck muscles are not very strong. And um, you see, and for that reason, with that impact, you see the subdural hematomas, you see the retinal hemorrhages um, that result. And so you can see some really serious cognitive impairment, um, blindness, and death. So what is the scope of the problem? Um, abusive head trauma is the leading cause of child abuse death in Texas and in the U.S. So um, Texas is also among states with the very highest rates of child abuse in the country. Um, and this slide, in Texas, we have an average of 191 diagnosed 
cases of abusive head trauma each year, but I want to make really clear that everybody sees the giant asterisk up there. Um, these are hospitalized cases only. They exclude kids that are treated and released from the emergency department. It excludes kids that are dead on arrival who never make it to the hospital or who go to the hospital and go straight to the morgue. And so the true estimates of child abuse are probably two and a half times greater than that. Unfortunately, our current surveillance systems and our current classification systems do not accurately capture that. So the true, true number is probably more like about 500 cases. So what happens to children who have been victimized um, by abusive head trauma? About a quarter of them die. Um, and those that survive experience some really serious cognitive impairment. Um, we see cerebral palsy, we see severe motor dysfunction, so kids have a hard time walking, um, blindness, seizures, mental retardation, and really less than one in ten kids that is shaken or experiences abusive head trauma resumes normal functioning. So let's talk about the cost. You can imagine um, these cases can be extremely costly. As I said, we see a couple of them per month, and oftentimes these kiddos, they don't come in and stay for a couple days and then leave. They're in for four, five, six weeks. And so that in itself can be costly, but then think about the physical, educational, occupational therapies that are ongoing for their lifetime that they have to access, and then you've got, oftentimes if they're removed from their family, you've got lifelong custodial care, and you've got legal costs. So these can easily exceed a million dollars per child. So what do you think the number one trigger for perpetration is? Who here has kids? Yeah, okay. So you can imagine, um, Who's seen this curve before? Who's seen this diagram before? Just a few of you? Okay, so this is the peak infant crying curve. So you can see that at about two weeks of age, an infant begins to cry more. At about five, um, six to eight weeks, they, they hit their crying peak, and they can cry up to five or six hours a day. So, and then it sort of tapers off at four to five months. So who cries the most? <laughs> Who's at greatest risk for abusive head trauma? Infants one to three months of age. Um, I think our average that we see is kiddos, infants that are about six weeks of age, the average. Um, and um, you can imagine that new parents, um, they're just sometimes not prepared for the amount of crying that infants do. Of, of those of you who raised your hands with kids, how many of your children cried for more than 20 minutes a day when they were in that phase? Yeah, it can be pretty, pretty tiring, huh? Um, so some other risk factors for abusive head trauma are poverty, financial stress. So there was a study by Rachel Berger that came out a few years ago that showed that during the economic downturn, the recession, the rates of abusive head trauma in various sites across the country actually almost doubled. Um, low educational level, young parental age, so parents, um, infants of children 20, age 20 or below, um, have a five times higher risk of, of being shaken than, than older. Um, than children of older parents. Um, male gender, males comprise about 70% of perpetrators. Um, maternal depression and lack of impulse control. So if you think that you know, our, our neocortex didn't really, doesn't really develop fully until we're 25 years old, there's a lot of people walking around out there with kids who are under 25 and who don't have a fully developed sense of impulse control. So what do we do about it? Um, at our hospital, at our network, we decided on a program called the Period of Purple Crying. We like this program for several reasons. It's based on 30 plus years of research on crying and infant development. It is a primary prevention program, so it touches everybody that comes to a birthing center and has a child, has a new baby. Um, it can also be reinforced um, secondarily 
and physicians' offices, through home visiting nurses, um, through parenting classes in emergency rooms. You'd be amazed. I, I ran the numbers, and last year we had 600 visits to our um, pediatric ED um, with the chief complaint of infant crying. So parents are very concerned about it, and they come in. Uh, the other thing we like about this program is that it's available in 10 languages, um, and Arabic is coming soon, and that it's affordable. It's $2 per unit when purchased in bulk. So over here you have a million dollars, and over here you have $2, which makes more sense. So the program itself, who has actually heard or seen the period of purple crying? Just a few of you. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, this program consists of a 27-minute online training for professionals, um, and the, it consists also of a DVD and booklet, kind of a packet. And so what the, what the parent experiences, what the family experiences in the hospital stay when they get their primary prevention, they watch a 10-minute film. Um, and then the nurse or other you know, trained professional gives them a three to four minute talk using the booklet as a guide. And then they take those materials home with them. That's a very important part of the program. And they sh they're encouraged to share those materials with anyone who will be caring for their child. Um, and on that film, there's an on that DVD, there's an additional 17 minute film um, on infant soothing. So what are some of the key messages? Well, PURPLE actually is an acronym, and it stands for Peak of Crying, which we talked about previously. It talks, the, the U is for unexpected, that the crying comes and goes. Um, R is for resist soothing, your baby may not stop crying no matter what you try. P is for pain-like face. L is for long-lasting, can last up to five or six hours a day. And E is for evening, that it clusters in the evening just when the parent is the most tired and frustrated. And so, um, a couple of the other key messages are that peak infant crying is normal, that it is okay to feel frustrated, um, and also that if the frustration is too much, put the baby in a safe place and walk away. Never shake or hurt a baby. Some caregivers may be unsafe, so choose wisely, and share these messages with everyone who cares for your child. So what are some of the program results? Um, some of the published results have shown improved knowledge on infant crying, um, in increased sharing of information on infant crying, dangers of shaking and walking away if frustrated. Um, it's also shown some improved behaviors in walking away, putting the baby in a safe place and walking away. And these are some of their pre-publication results. I just got these from um, the 14th International Conference on Shaken Baby and Abusive Head Trauma earlier this week, um, that parents report feeling less frustrated about their infant crying. They feel less stressed about their infants crying. They've seen a reduction in calls to the nurse line on infant crying, a reduction in ER visits due to infant crying, and a reduction in shaken baby and abusive head trauma hospitalization by about 38%. So these, this is a map, I think you saw this map earlier in the plenary session. Um, this is a map of, of purple states and, and other countries. It's also been do, being done in Japan, Australia, um, the purple, the dark purple are states that are doing it system-wide. The light purple um, have a certain percentage of hospitals um, doing the program and different community programs. Um, you can see Texas, we're not, we're white. <laughs> we're, not, we're not light purple, we're not dark purple yet. But we're hoping to get there. So I asked the National Center for a list of sites that are currently um, implementing the program in San Antonio, and they mentioned San Antonio Army Community Services, University Hospital San Antonio, 
And unfortunately, I was floored. I called the Learn CPR and First Aid Safety phone number, and they do the training for home, for foster cares and child care providers. Um, and they told me that it used to be a requirement to do the, per the period of purple crying, but they no longer do it because it's no longer a requirement by the state. And that just about broke my heart. I thought, gosh, what a missed opportunity there. Um, but an opportunity that I'm very excited to be a part of. Um, we are working as part of the Child Protection Roundtable requesting legislative funding for abusive head trauma prevention services. We're hoping to ask for a little over five million from the Texas legislature so that hospitals and home visiting organizations can apply for funds to implement the period of purple crying in their communities across Texas. So please keep your fingers crossed on that one. So, <laughs> I love this picture. Um, I just wanna you know, take this opportunity since I have the microphone. Um, I really do think that it is incumbent upon us to be leaders on this issue. As one of uh, the states that has superlative rates of child abuse, it's our job and it's really, <laughs> it's, it's really our responsibility to advocate prevention of abusive head trauma. And so let's be leaders. Let's, let's turn Texas purple. Let's, let's, let's really um, take up the mantle on this one. So with that. Um, Do you want to take a question or two? Yeah, I can take some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, and that's more information um, if you want to write down the information on the National Center. Um, and also, if anyone is interested in the period of purple crying, Julie Price is the director of international programs, and she'd probably end up giving you my name anyway as a local implementer. So um, you can always reach out to me as well. Yeah, any questions? Okay. Well then, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Halvox, who is going to introduce herself. <laughs> I know how to work this. Okay. I'm technically challenged. Hang on. Oh, there we go. All right, um, I'm Rachel Halvox. I'm, I'm senior, man senior manager of partner relations with Haven for Hope. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about Haven for Hope today. Um, Kathy Fletcher with Voices for Children asked me to talk about my experience of becoming a new parent uh, in New Zealand. Um, so it's a consumer perspective of it. I was fortunate to um, have a child, which was nice, and then also to have that child in New Zealand and experience their um, parenting program that they have available. So I just want to go over that with you guys. So some of the main points I want to cover is their well child, or it's called uh, tamariki ora, which is the Maori word for well child. Services that are available to new parents living in New Zealand. Um, the network of providers available to new parents living in New Zealand. The Parenting Together New Mother Group. Overall Plunkett programs and the Plunkett uh, Family Violence Evaluation Project that they have. Sorry. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Some of the things I wanted to focus on, um, first of all, with the Well Child Tamariki uh, Ora service, is that it is available to all uh, individuals. Um, I'm a U.S. citizen. My child was a U.S. citizen. When she was born, they actually changed the rules so she doesn't have dual citizenship, unfortunately. And they changed that 24 days before she was born. So, um, but they did reach out to us and ask us and provided us with the service that was available. Being a, a brand new parent, we were halfway around the world from our family. Uh, not a lot of close friends nearby. Um, it's about an 18-hour uh, time difference as well. To, so to try to call my friends who were new, uh, new parents as well to get some advice was, was difficult in navigating those uh, dateline uh, changes. So, um, so it is a free uh, service that's available. 90% of the parents in New Zealand participate in this program. It is offered 
Um, as soon as they learn that, as soon as you find, identify a midwife or you go to a hospital, as soon as you learn that you're pregnant, they loop you into the system right away to let you know that these services are available for you um, at the time that you give birth. So some of the programs that are available are the Health Education and Health Promotion, um, which is the Thriving Under Five and the Well Child book, which um, actually brought samples of them here that they give out. Of course, it changes every year, the cover, but, um, and it is written in two languages. It's written in Maori and it's written in English as well. Um, and then they have the health pr um, protection and clinical assessment, which are the Plunkett nurses and the well child visits that occur as well. And then the fauna care and support, um, the WH actually is a F sound, so it's fauna care and support. And that is the parenting together and new moms groups that they have available. So you're given three different providers for your uh, well child tamariki ora services from birth to uh, four to six weeks of age. Uh, you have your midwife or your GP. Being brand new to the country and learning that I was pregnant, I had no idea how to find a midwife. Um, went to our closest hospital, which was the Christchurch Women's Hospital. When they said, you need to find a midwife, I thought, um, I don't know how to go about doing that. They noticed my accent. They said, you're American? And I said, yes. <laughs> you just come to the hospital, we'll take care of you. That's what you're used to. So, <laughs> so that's why I actually I had a team of seven midwives that I worked through during my pregnancy. I was able to meet all of them during that time. So from four to six uh, weeks to four to four and a half years of age, um, you're ident they identify a well, a well child provider in, in our neighborhood that we lived in. Okay, And so you not only get your general practitioner or your pediatrician, you get your Plunkett nurse. If you're of Maori descent, you get a Maori provider. If you're a Pacific Islander, you would get a Pacific provider and or a public health service. And then you can see up there that it shows that at one year of age, they're going to um, refer you to a dental therapist. At three, four, and five, you'll have the hearing and vision tests that are available at the uh, uh, educational center or the schools. At five years of age, the parent and child, um, you get a, your general practitioner, your public health service. At the age of five, every child begins school on their fifth birthday. So they will have all of this in place, and then on their fifth birthday, they learn a brand new system of life. So, so I just wanted to show to everybody kind of what the timeline looks like. So you can see the pre-birth, um, you get a car seat rental scheme that's available. You, we didn't have a car at the time, we didn't really need it. Uh, we were taking public transportation, so our buggy worked just fine for us. But the car, re, uh, car seat rental was $25, and that's for your, inf uh, for your newborn. As your child gets older and you get a toddler car seat, um, you upgrade, they will upgrade that for you free of charge as well. So you turn one in, you get a new one out. So. The other things, as you can see, um, how it kind of correlates, you have the clinical services and the volunteer services and the parenting supports that are available. So um, at newborn, you're referred to the Plunkett system. Within the first four to six weeks, you have your first home visit um, during that purple phase, you know, phase time that Sarah was just talking about. And you're also introduced to the Plunkett system. And then it'll work through it. Um, at seven to eight weeks, you're then introduced to uh, a parenting new mother group that is a six-week session and you proceed to work your way down as you uh, as your child gets older the visits become less and less um, and so you can see that all outlined for you so the parenting together new mother group um, that does happen at four to six weeks um, they are six weeks in length, and they connect you, again, to your neighborhood um, Plunkett Community Center. It is free of charge. It is for anyone of any economic um, status. So whether you're upper middle class or um, lower middle class, whatever it may be, it's all incomes, all ethnic backgrounds it's open to. Um, anyone can attend it. Um, but what it's doing is so it's connecting you to your neighbors who just recently had a child just like you. So for my kiddo, she had, in her little group, there were kids that were maybe a couple of weeks older and a couple of weeks younger. So you have that whole time frame there. 
So we would have weekly meetings um, where we're meeting the other moms. Um, and all of our kiddos close in age, it's kind of fun at first because they all just lay down on the floor and then as you grow, they start to crawl and then you're on you know, parent watch duty and everything. Um, one of the great things that I learned the time there was that they didn't have Cheerios and you know every toddler loves Cheerios here in the US. Their version of Cheerios are little sausages, so that was a little hard to explain to them that no, they're actually round cereals. So I had to have family ship it over and we have a photo of all the little Kiwi kids learning to eat Cheerios, the cereal, for the first time, and it was pretty cute. <laughs> um, so in this weekly meeting that we would have, we'd have a speaker come, and you can see some of the sessions in the third bullet point that they provide there during that time. That session's about an hour, and then you're welcome to stay afterwards for tea. Um, so they have just basically, it's a community center, you're sitting there, you can hang out, um, you just, shut, when you're ready to leave, you just turn off the lights, clean up your dishes, and walk on out. And it's like, for hours, it's at the end of a little cul-de-sac, and you just head on out. It's like it was a neighborhood home for folks. So um, it was a great opportunity. And, and we did, various people would stay for various lengths of time, depending upon if you're catching buses or you're driving home, or, or you just really needed to talk to another parent who was going through the same experience you were. So after the Parenting Together New Mother Group, um, the Plunkett nurse actually provides everyone with a contact list. Here are all the other moms that you've been hanging out with. Here's their kids, here's their birth dates, here's where you guys live in the neighborhood to each other in case you want to get together. And then it's the, it's the responsibility of the parents to, to carry on the group if they want to. They don't have to meet there, they can if they want to, if they, if they want to um, but they have to schedule a particular time. So in my program, there were 16 of us. 13 of them continued with the program. Some of them dropped out a couple of weeks into it. They weren't, what they weren't interested. Six, uh, six moms continued into weekly and monthly programs. So we would meet at the park. We would meet at the library, at each other's homes. And then the fathers started getting involved which was really cool, because then you had all of these families that were meeting together on a regular basis. We actually celebrated our first, um, first birthday party all together, and we were able to use the original Plunkett Center where we all met. So it was a nice little celebration for us to have. As of today, I am still in contact with five of the other families via social media. Uh, we, together, we all were send photos back and forth, see how we're doing. Someone just had their first communion. So you get to see that, you get to see another kid learn sailing from their first time. All those new experiences, you get to see them from when they were very little to present day. So I just wanted to list um, what the Plunkett services that are available. So they do a home visit right after you have your child. Um, for me, I was very fortunate for a healthy delivery to stay in the hospital for a week. They were like, stay as long as you want. So. I stayed for about five days, and then I left. <laughs> um, but they also had um, breastfeeding nurses that came in to make sure everything was going OK. Every time that um, I, I opted on breastfeeding, um, but the option was if you did not want to breastfeed, you had to sign a waiver every time that, um, to say that it was OK for my child to have formula. So that was a big thing. They really are big in promoting breastfeeding. Um, but um, once you get home, they have about four to six visits after that time of being home where they're bringing, they're coming to you. You do not have to go out to the hospital. Um, they're all going to come and, and visit with you. And then after that sixth visit, they will then start connecting you to the community and, and to their clinic as well. Um, and the clinic is in the same location as the community center. So it's pretty much a one-stop shop. And then the, um, you see the clinic or what I visits. Um, so in the first year, they're pretty regular, and here are some of the services that they provide. The family centers are what I was talking about with the community um, facility. So you can go there. They will have uh, a nurse that's on duty to just be there in case you need immediate assistance. You need a, I need help from someone. Can you, can you help me for the moment? They'll take your kid if you even need to just nap. You know, your kid's been crying and now they're, <laughs> they won't stop crying. Let me just take a nap for a few moments to regenerate myself or rejuviate myself. Um, they continue with parenting education and support. Um, the Plunkett line, it's a 24-7 line that anybody can call. And I love how they say, regardless of how silly your questions may be. I know we called one time when our 
kid had ecto green poo, and we we're like, what happened to her? She ate too many peas. <laughs> so, um, but then also the child safety and car seat, car seat scheme, which I talked about a little bit earlier. They continue with the health promotion and information. Again, that's the um, Thriving Under Five book and the uh, uh, Well Child Tamariki Ora book that's available. Um, let me just pick this up for a second. The great thing about this is that I don't have multiple hands, so I can't do this off, but it breaks down things for you, one to two years old, what you're gonna be experiencing. They have a whole section of safety in here how to do CPR if you need it. But one of the most important things I found was at birth, right away. It says right there across the top, birth. Cried spontaneously, gave me all my measurements for my kid. And then proceeded, every appointment after that are listed in here. You know, it's all throughout. In the very back, all of my immunization records for my kiddo are listed. So you take this with you every time you visit, or they come to visit you in those first five years. Some of the other things were the um, parents as first teachers, um, really continuing if there were any other additional classes that you wanted to be a part of, they had those available as well. The antenatal classes, the mobile units for those who may have been in more remote areas of New Zealand, they will come out to you. And then lastly, I just wanted to focus on the Plunkett Family Violence Evaluation Project. My time out in New Zealand, um, my husband was there for a postdoctoral research fellowship, and I was fortunate to be a part of a research program as well as the Family Violence, um, New Ze I'm sorry, it was the New Zealand Family Violence Clearinghouse, where we were able to collect uh, research on violence occurring in New Zealand. For a population of three million individuals, there is actually quite a high, uh, high percentage of violence that goes on there. So with the Plunkett system, what they were trying to do was really have someone who is in the home able to ask screening questions on a regular basis to see what's going on, to, to kind of uh, reduce it as quick as they could. Some of their research summaries, I won't read them all, but some of those I thought were interesting were um, the so they interviewed the Plunkett staff and the individuals, um, the moms who um, get visits from the Plunkett nurses. But they talked about their initial anxiety and apprehension. The Plunkett staff did uh, first about asking about family violence um, early on. They realized that the relationship changes as you and your Plunkett nurse get to know one another. Um, I know at times I had uh, a couple of disputes with my own Plunkett nurse in regards to her method that she felt I should do and my own thoughts about it as well. But we were very open to disagreeing <laughs> at times. Um, so, but you do have to build that relationship before, you, uh, before someone would be willing to disclose that there's violence in the home, which I think was important. Um, they do have particular screening questions, and I believe those questions are in the, um, the evaluation report, which the source is on the next page as well. Um, 64% had documentation of family violence screening that was occurring, um, and 6% had evidence of a positive screen response. So they are able to identify it up you know, while they're visiting with hooks in their home. And then there's a significant variation in the screening across locations. If you're more in a remote area versus in a more urban area, they would have that information too. And then lastly, um, there, at the very bottom, there is the website. This is also, I believe, available electronically for everybody who's here as well if you want to investigate it further. But just wanted to let you guys know about that. Do you guys have any questions at this point? Yes, ma'am. This is the government. Yeah, there's actually um, the royal, um, what do they call it? The, um, what's their official title that they have? The Royal New Zealand Plunkett Society is government funded, and then you have the Ministry of uh, Social Development that also helps in funding those resources. Yeah, anything else? Yes, ma'am. It's mainly um, offered to first time moms, but I can, they can offer it to second and third time moms as well. I know within our group, 
There was one mother who, this was her second child, she requested to be a part of it because she had such, um, such a horrible postpartum depression the first time. And it took, uh, she told us this probably about eight weeks into us all knowing one another, that she, she, the reason why she signed up to continue with the Plunkett program was because in her first pregnancy, she was living in London at the time, and she was standing on the balcony of her flat about ready to throw her and herself, or herself and her child off the balcony due to postpartum depression. So she was like, this is why I'm here, and this is why I have the connection, the network, to continue with that. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I'm going to introduce you to uh, Colonel Karen Weiss now. I, um, I am Colonel Karen Weiss. I am an active duty Air Force uh, nurse. And I, uh, I'm not in my uniform uh, because I'm really not here to speak on behalf of the military. I'm here to tell you about a program that we offer within the military. So I uh, didn't come in uniform. I am uh, currently the Dean of the Medical Education and Training Campus, but I am a registered nurse. And I've spent most of my career working in obstetrics as a labor and delivery nurse. Um, and I'm also a nurse scientist, and this project that I'm going to talk about is it developed through uh, about over almost 20 years of research. Um, I have to disclose that there, I have no financial disclosures, and, the, and the, the information I'm going to provide is my thoughts, not those of the military. So, so you've heard a little bit about. I, 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 I'm not going to speak really about child abuse, but I'm going to speak about the, a preventive program that is meant to de decrease um, maternal anxiety and stress and, in, and depression. And you've heard the, what can happen when mothers have depression, postpartum depression in particular, but even prenatal depression. And the other aspect of this program is um, hopefully we'll the reason it was developed is we know, and I'll speak to it, that um, we want to decrease low birth weight and preterm labor, and those are other predictors of, uh, of child abuse. So um, prenatal maternal anxiety is predictive of early gestational age, low birth weight, higher rates of childhood illness, um, and also physical and cognitive developmental delays, which also are predictive of uh, child abuse. And again, prenatal depression is linked to low birth weight. It's linked to preterm birth and poor maternal attachment, which again, anytime there's poor maternal infant attachment, we run into problems um, as mothers late, um, in postpartum. So um, the following, a lot of people do research, not a lot at first, I guess, but those of us that do research in maternal uh, anxiety and stress, a lot of people do generalized evaluation of stress, but when you do generalized evaluation of stress, you can't intervene because you don't know what the stress is that you now have to intervene on. The work that I've done in the past uh, 15 to 20 years looks specifically at anxiety and stress that a woman has relative to being pregnant. And the factors that women um, feel relative to being a mother, we have predicted these things. So that the fears and the anxiety that a woman experiences relative to her acceptance of pregnancy, and I could go into all the different components that make up these, but it would take a while, but I will foot stomp, that when you talk about acceptance to pregnancy, it's body images, it's discomfort, it's the pain, um, it's all of those things that go into, into early pregnancy, and it is predictive of preterm birth. Also, a woman's ability to identify with their motherhood role, how they're going to be as a mother, what is that? And did they have a role model? And who is that role model? Um, it's predictive of preterm birth. And then their feelings and their, and their preparation for labor, um, uh, their concerns and their fears re relative to their preparation for labor, that was also predictive of preterm birth. And then this component, this feeling of well-being of themselves and their own unborn child, so their fears relative to, the, to themselves and what might happen to themselves in labor, or even as they carry their unborn child, so maybe uh, fears of, of, of physical harm uh, to themselves and their unborn child were predictive of preterm birth. 
So um, these two components relative to maternal anxiety were predictive of low birth weight. And, and, and the low birth weight is a very much, um, there's a less in the literature related to anxiety and stress and fear relative to low birth weight. But preparation for labor, so again, their fears relative to how they're going to work through the labor process and how that's going to be for them. And I'm gonna tell you after being in this um, area, for almost 20 years. I mean, when I started in labor and delivery, most women came in, they, I, I, natural childbirth, and now we've transitioned to a, to a generation that if um, probably about 93% of all women, they expect to have an epidural, and they're, they are almost frantic if they think there's any way that they're not going to have an epidural. And so if that's the way that they're gonna handle that, it's, it's very, very concerning to them, and they don't have a plan. So, um, and it, so it's predictive of low birth weight. And then their helplessness and loss of control, and this is kind of a, a complicated factor, but it kind of plays into the preparation for labor. Um, it's very unusual nowadays in this generation of how, of their feelings about helplessness and loss of control. But those fears and anxieties relative to their ability to, to deal with that were predictive of low birth weight. So another really important component about being a mother and being pregnant and dealing with the fears and anxiety relative to that is your self-esteem. And those of us that are mothers know that while you're pregnant, you're, you feel guilty about everything. You know, did I eat the right food? Or did I have a drink and I was pregnant and I didn't know it? Um, and then once you have the child, it, a lot of times it can be, you know, the father of the baby, your husband, no matter how much he cares, but they make you feel guilty. Your mother makes you feel guilty. Your aunts and uncles make you feel guilty. <laughs> so um, it's important to uh, build a strong self-esteem. And that, if, when they have poor self-esteem, it is predictive. Uh, it, um, we, there's a problem with depression and anxiety as well. So it's important that we build a strong self-esteem with the father of the baby. And that I'm gonna foot stomp. There, the relationship to the father of the baby and the relationship to the maternal mother are critical to the woman's um, progressing through pregnancy. And when that mother does not have a strong relationship with her mother, there has to be somebody to fill that role. And when her husband or father of the baby is not around, there has to be somebody to fill that role. And I'll talk a little bit about that relative to the military and, and, the, and the things that we face with the absence of the fathers due to deployments, et cetera. So unique to the military population, women with deployed husbands, and this is actually research that I did. Initially, I followed uh, 95 women who were all deployed, had deployed husbands, and it was in Florida where the special ops community is. And these men in the special ops community are um, deployed without any notice, and they're deployed to locations where there's no communication with their families. And so these women, um, a lot of them had no communication with their husbands, and those women that could not communicate with their husbands had lower self-esteem. Because again, when you're pregnant, that husband or that father of the baby, they're, they're building up that woman to be the mother that she needs to be. And that role that is played by that person, they're the people that tell that mother, you're gonna be a wonderful mother, you're beautiful, you're taking great care of yourself. That's a great plan that you have. But when nobody is telling them that, it, it can be a problem. So, um, Women that had deployed husbands, uh, and those same women, we discovered that they actually had lower acceptance of their pregnancy as well, which is a pretty uh, amazing finding. And it, even more importantly, those women that had low acceptance of their pregnancy, you would expect it to gradually go away as they went through pregnancy. We had cases where these men were um, back before the women delivered, and even when those men returned before the delivery, those women had lower satisfaction in their maternal role than anybody else. Um, so, and that's that, that last line. And that's, that's, imp that's important to know because we also know that these women, so, so acceptance to pregnancy in the first trimester, despite the fact that their husband's return, affected their satisfaction in the maternal role. And, their, and satisfaction in the maternal role is predictive of child abuse. So esteem building community support, we looked at that, and this is actually exactly what we measured. Again, a lot of people that do research measure a lot of different components of support. They measure tangible support. We're really good about giving books and giving blankets and giving all these things when you're expecting a baby. That's tangible support. Um, 
we are really good about giving information support. But the important support is the esteem building support that you get from the community, a little bit of, of what she was talking about in New Zealand, in that that community of support, that peer group, it's extremely important. So we did find that when the women um, said that they had a strong community of support, they, had, they did decrease their fears relative to acceptance of pregnancy, relative to identification of the motherhood role, preparation for, will, for labor, well-being of self and baby, relationship with their mother, relationship with husband. And more importantly, and I'll foot stomp this, that in the military, we asked them, do you believe your community of support is, in the, is, it, is the military um, component, or is your uh, community of reference the civilian community? And when they said their community of reference was their military um, community, they did better. So in other words, we need to be surrounded by those that we know and, and we believe understand us. So um, we also discovered timing when you build interventions is important. And we discovered that support had the greatest effect in the first and second trimesters of pregnancy. Because again, women walk around, they're pregnant. They don't, in the first trimester, nobody knows. They're, they're, they may be pretty quiet about it, um, but they need support. And then, um, this formed the basis for building the MOMS program. So all of these findings I just described were, were formed the basis for the Mentors Offering Maternal Support Program, of which I'm going to talk about. So we designed a mentor support intervention program. And when I talk about the mentors, they are other women mothers. Um, they go through a training program that I built and designed based on these findings. So for every one of these aspects of anxiety, it, they, they learn all about that aspect so that when they, the women come to the class, they can help them with that. Um, the timing of the intervention is specific to the type of anxiety, and it starts in the first trimester, and it goes for eight weeks every other week, um, which will take them to the end of their, to the beginning of their third trimester, which if, you know, if you think about pregnancy, um, at the beginning of the third trimester, we're really good about offering interventions. At that point in time, you go to birthing classes, you go to lactation classes, you go to epidural classes, you go to all kinds of things at the beginning of the third trimester. But these women need something in the first and second trimester of pregnancy. And so now we've, we've met that. By the time they're to their third trimester, they don't, it's not as important. Now there's other avenues. I'll tell you, this one continues, though. So we train the mentors, um, and we have a manual. And this is actually the old manual. Um, it's gone through revision, and based on the input from the women, um, we built, we added a postpartum chapter. I added a multigravita chapter. Um, so every every aspect we cover each week. So each week is a fo focused discussion on one of those anxieties, on one of those dimensions, and um, we that that guides the discussion and keeps it focused, so we don't go off on tangents. <laughs> um, and that focused discussion is is. Uh, focused also around family connectedness and resilience, because we want to build the self-esteem, we want to build coping, and we want to build resilience. So these are some of the um, findings. And EPDS, for those of you that work in, in the depression uh, work, you know that that's a measure of depression. Uh, it's been validated for postpartum as well as prenatal measure. And um, the women in the uh, treatment group did have a, a significant change in their level in their depression. And the control group actually would appear that they went up slightly. You can see that there's a difference. They were randomized. This, they were totally randomized to the control of the treatment group. Um, what happened, at the, um, and you see up there, cohort with no history, history of no deliveries. So this would be like the quartiles, or when you break the higher risk group. So the, the women that had never had a delivery did have a higher instance of depression. And we affected that depression with that group the, 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 the greatest. The brief is a measure of resilience. And so again, it would appear as if um, there was a significant change in the treatment group for, them, for their feelings of resilience, um, a greater self-esteem and coping uh, after the treatment, after being a part of the moms. So I just put these themes up here from the women because in addition to meeting with them every week, these, these things, these statements come out from them. And, and the, the pressure and the... And they share, this is what they are able to share together, and they talk through, and that it, it helps them. But um, they, women in the military, wives, and, I, and people are probably thinking, well, there's women, there's active duty women, and I probably should say, I took all the demographic information out because I didn't want to make it a research presentation. But um, so 
obviously in the military to be a dependent to get care as for your pregnancy, you either have to be a wife of an active duty military member or you'd have to be an active duty pregnant woman. We have both of those. So the only women that might not be married are the active duty pregnant women because they, you know, that's the way it works in the military. Um, so the women that, that are married to a military uh, member, uh, their spouse, um, have a profound um, fear or need. I mean, they feel like they have to um, totally support their husband in the mission. And if they don't do a good job of that, then it will impact their husband's career. Um, they, there's a lot of unwanted moves, and it puts additional stress on the women. And then they're pregnant, and they're moving maybe at, while they're pregnant. And as she mentioned, you know, she's in New Zealand, and she didn't have, know anybody. She had no family or friends around. Well, this happens every day in the military. Um, and then they, in the military, you know, it's 24-7. The spouses aren't around. The women feel like um, their, their husbands are gone at any point in time. They're not home for a lot, a lot of hours, and they feel very isolated and lonely. Um, and then they ha have fears that if their pregnancy doesn't go well, um, or if they you know, need his help in the pregnancy, that it will have ramifications. Oh, no, this is actually, that, that happened. But this statement is from the active duty women. We had, we had uh, more than a few active duty women um, and it's not actually ongoing as we speak, but I'm speaking of women that have been in it. Um, they, they actually are active duty pregnant women, and they don't want their commanders to know because they feel like it have ramifications on their career if their commander knows that they're going to be a mother and not just an, uh, an, an active duty member. So we've, we actually have had several women, and I, we had a woman with severe depression um, that we helped a great deal. We've had several women, that one, one woman in particular who was pregnant when her husband deployed and she didn't want to have the baby and she actually, I think she very much disliked her husband and she didn't want him to have the child either. Uh, we helped her uh, and to the point that she uh, was very happy that she carried on with her pregnancy and that she loves that child very, very much and she's glad that she made the decision she did. Um, I could get, tell you about endless stories in which we've helped these women resolve a lot of conflict they were having over their pregnancies. Um, we have decreased their depression, and it, as I indicated, we've increased their resilience. The um, mentoring program, um, just like that kind of that peer mentoring program that was already mentioned, it creates friendships and bonds among the military wives and mothers. We do have a Facebook page. They love it, and they post pictures of their babies. They stay in contact. We have women that come after they deliver. Um, ironically, you know, you wonder how it happens, but maybe by God's grace or something that these women, I've had classes where every single woman in the class is, they may have been IVF women, and they, it's like they just seem to find the right class for each other. It, it is just an odd thing, but, and they're so happy because collectively together, they're, they have the same stresses. Um, very high satisfaction with the program. And um, it is, while we may design this program for the military population, it's easily transferable to the civilian population um, as well. Again, uh, we're, the hope is, uh, the original hope, I mean, I'm talking to you about child abuse, but my work is about decreasing the incidence of preterm birth and low birth weight. And so the idea is that if we can decrease anxiety and stress in pregnancy, then we can de um, decrease the incidence of preterm birth and low birth weight. And um, obviously, it provides the mothers with a supportive network uh, before and after pregnancy. And I just, um, it is a funded project by Tri Service Nursing Research Program. Are there any questions? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, right now, um, because it's sort of a, it's a program that we've designed and we're gathering data relative to it, it's in the, so it isn't that it's not for any service, so it's collectively wherever you live in your community, it, we all get care in the same area. So at least here in the San Antonio military community, which we're doing the project right now, um, all of our care is together. So if you're a Marine or you're a, a sailor, everybody's getting it. Everybody, it's open to everybody. Well, um, it's, it, we have the project in Florida, and we have it here. But, we, you know, we have to, 
how it works, of course, is you have to show that it's effective, and then hopefully we'll be able to roll it out across um, the, you know, the military and even potentially um, civilian. I will say I didn't, I didn't want to talk about the programs that we have available, but I think we, ha you know, she listed the purple um, the uh, pro project and that. Um, it's at Army, but we actually have it from all of our family advocacy uh, centers across um, the military offer that. And we have home health nurses that go out and visit our high-risk um, families, et cetera. So there are a lot, a lot of programs. This is just one of the uh, prenatal programs that we, that we have right now that we're working on. Thank you. Great question. Good afternoon. My name is Cheryl Wisey. I'm the nurse supervisor for the Nurse Family Partnership Program. Our implementing agency is the Children's Shelter here in San Antonio. The Children's Shelter is a nationally accredited nonprofit, soon to be certified as a trauma informed care agency. And uh, we have a family of services. And I, our particular program um, belongs to the Family Strengthening Department at the Children's Shelter. And um, Nurse Family Partnership, I should say, is, uh, is a program that's been across the country. If you, you may already know, I know many in here already know about Nurse Family Partnership. Um, it is a program that is, has over 35 years of research across the nation in some other countries. It is a program where you pair a first-time mom, a low-income first-time mom, with a, with a, a, a BSN-prepared RN, and um, that nurse works with that mom from pregnancy up until the time her baby's two years old. So it's a, it's a pretty long, intense program, and it provides a lot of services here in San Antonio. I should tell you that the, uh, the Children's Shelter, as our implementing agency site, um, be, began, um, uh, chose to launch this program in 2008. They were one of the first agencies across the state to, um, to, to take on a nurse family partnership program. In, uh, um, in Texas today, there are 21 sites. There were 18 at the time. They were originally funded by the Texas legislator. We, we are paid from uh, the Health and Human Services Commission with, uh, with matching funds from our implementing agency. There are currently two other sites in San Antonio. University Health System has a nurse family partnership program and a brand new site, Catholic Charities. Well, Catholic Charities isn't new, but their site is a brand new a nurse family partnership uh, site and um, they are beginning to serve. So all together, we have the capacity to serve 525 families across Bear County and maybe a little bit outside of Bear County. But um, that is something we wish could be more because as you know, there are more than 525 families who could use a nurse, a home visiting nurse to come and offer services these ladies talked about family support and the importance in the prevention system, in the, in the idea of preventing child abuse. And um, once you, you pair that nurse with a first-time mom and they develop that therapeutic relationship, it is, it is successful, I can tell you. And I can give you uh, plenty of outcomes to say that we are a massive, as uh, some of the nurses who are here, a massive data gathering um, machine, and we can tell you that um, since implementation, we've our particular site has served over 700 families, over 500 babies, and uh, we've provided a lot of support. And so, the philosophy behind Nurse Family Partnership, which, like I said, has over 35 years of um, of research in history, um, actually, our National Service Office is in Denver, Colorado, with the University of Colorado. Dr. David Oles, um, this is a community health and a client-centered philosophy. We're a strength-based program. We find those things our moms do well. Yes, when we walk into a home and we make a relationship with our mom and they voluntarily join and enroll, you know, we're asking them what's important to them. We're asking them what kind of goals that they want to make. And uh, these nurses that work at our program work very hard to empower first-time moms. And I can tell you just the other day, talking to one of our nurses, she said to me, 
This is called empowerment. <laughs> And that is actually a fact. That is very, very much a fact. So we empower first-time moms living in poverty to successfully change their lives and the lives of their children. So um, they need to be a first-time mom. They have to be at or below 185th of the federal poverty level. Um, all of these items that are started are by self-declaration. Basically, if a mom uh, qualifies for WIC, she can qualify for our program. She does not have to be Medicaid eligible. Essentially, they need to reside in our service area, which is Bear County, although we have a few that are just in a little bit uh, outlying the county. We need to enroll them before their 28th week of pregnancy because that one of our goals is to improve pregnancy outcomes. And so when you match that nurse with that mom and you get them early enough, you can certainly do that. And of course, they need to be, it's voluntary. So what do we offer? Um, when, when I get a referral in and we assign it to a nurse, we get, um, you get, uh, the, the, the client gets an experienced BSN, RN, and I can tell you that our group of nurses, I have to say, I do, I, I do preach the program, it's really a good program, but I can tell you within our particular group of nurses, we have so much experience, we have labor and delivery nurses, we have pediatric specialty nurses, we have nurses who are experienced in psychiatric uh, nursing and nurses who have done a lot of community health and some um, NICU nurses. So they have a lot of experience. And so I push that as much as I push the program. So they deliver our nurse family partnership model of care. They start visiting with the mom and they about visit with them about every other week during the pregnancy and up until the time the child is two years old. In the beginning, they meet with them generally about once a week in their home, kind of to get to know them. And then they meet with them every other week. But once they have that baby, during that six-week time, postpartum, where it's so crucial that you, that you have a nurse or you have someone who's trained looking at are they bonding? Are they interacting? Is that baby feeding well? Um, is the baby growing? Does she have problems with breastfeeding? Um, how are, what's her support system in her family? When you can assess that in the home, so you're there once a week. You're the eyes and ears of the pediatrician. Some of our moms are very young. We're the eyes and ears of the schools. Um, you know, it's, and, and of course we're reporting if we see a situation that needs to be reported to Child Protective Services, but we're right there in a very intimate setting. Um, so mothers and, child, and children receive their ongoing assessments because you know what? First of all, we're nurses, so we're weighing, we're measuring, we're looking at those kinds of things. But we also um, will, uh, if, we, if we assess a situation where a child isn't developing like they should or the mom needs some other kind of medical assistance, then we're, of course, we're referring and we're catching them early. So we offer case management, we refer to other uh, services, we do have, we contract with um, Our Lady of the Lake and their counseling center who will provide in-home counseling as well. And we do with a, a because we're, our implementing agency is the Children's Shelter, we are able to offer some basic needs support as well. Sometimes we find a mom who doesn't have a safe place for her baby to sleep, well, we'll work to find um, a, a crib, a pack and play or something for they can sleep. Maybe they don't have a car seat. Maybe the car seat they had was used. Maybe it was in a car wreck before. And so we're going to work to find some of those basic needs that they need. So the goals of Nurse Family Partnership, and this is through our National Service Office, of course, is to improve pregnancy outcomes, and to improve the health and the development of, their, of the child. We're also working to improve the self-sufficiency of the mom. We're asking them what's important to you. What do you want to do in your life? Where do you see yourself in five years? And so we use motivational interviewing and a lot of other those kinds of things to help them see, is it time for another baby? Is it, do they need to wait? Is it, you know, how do they see themselves? What, it, what would another baby look like in their life? Maybe they want to go to college. Let's look at that. And then last but certainly not least, what the support that we provide prevents child abuse and neglect, and it strengthens fragile families. And that's what we're there for. And um, that is one of our highlighting goals. Whoops, back up one. Will it back up? Well, I can, it, I can tell you that that last slide gives you some of the outcomes of our, um, of our particular uh, program at the Children's Shelter. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Greeley. <laughs> He's overqualified. <laughs> okay, should I hit it forward? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so at, at our particular agency, these are the most recent outcomes we have. Um, and these are, um, uh, some of them are cumulative and some of them are with active clients. So we have some really good outcomes about, uh, I can tell you some of the quality improvement projects we're working on to increase our breastfeeding rates at six months and uh, to, um, to increase our, to decrease our preterm birth rate. You can see that our, um, our babies are current with immunizations, and this is above the, the NFP state percentage, and that's because our nurses are there in the home helping them get requalified for Medicare, Medicaid and helping them uh, get those doctor visits or on the phone with the doctor sometimes. Our babies are developmentally on target because we're working with them on some very important parent interactions, things that they can do because most of the moms, I can tell you, looking at their goals, what they want to do is they want to be the best parent that they can be. So we're there showing them some parenting things and some, some ways that they can do that. And, um, and so by teaching them and by showing them and asking them what's important to them, you're going to find that a lot of the moms are going to wait until their baby is about two years old to have that next baby because they're envisioning their life. And, um, and our babies and our moms don't have substantiated case of child abuse and neglect because part of the reason is we're providing support in the home. And that is, that is really the key that I think that sounds like the, the same thing we've been hearing with all, with all the other uh, presentations in this panel is support is a really key issue to keeping uh, babies from being abused and neglected. Um, and that is me. Thank you so much. So, um, I have to go leave and catch a flight, but, <laughs> just for the good part. Uh, first of all, are there any questions for Cheryl about the Nurse Family Partnership, the program, how it's run here in San Antonio? Yes, sir. Let me get into it. Ah. Oh, into the Nurse Family Partnership? Well, we get referrals from lots of places. We, of course, it is a free program. We get referrals. We make, we do outreach to a lot of different areas. We do outreach to pregnancy testing centers. We get uh, referrals from them, from OB clinics. Uh, we get referrals from the schools, and that may be why a lot of our moms, our median age is 17. We also get referrals from the juvenile detention center and from uh, the, uh, we've made outreach to the San Antonio Police Department and to some of their varying agencies and to their probation officers, so we get referrals from probation officers. We also get referrals from the Child Protective Services System. Not, from, not because a mom has abused or done anything, because this is for first-time moms, but there, we also get, um, some of our moms have been victims, of, uh, and they're minors, and so we get referrals from Child Protective Services workers as well. You said that the cohort was about 500, but the end was much bigger. What's the total need? Well, you know what? If we could serve every, medic, every WIC eligible um, uh, family in the community, and, and right now we're that, we're, that's an, an initiative we're working on, getting referrals and actually partnering with WIC to, to do some referrals with them, it would be enormous because there are probably 20 WIC clinics across the county. Uh, the majority of them belong to the city of San Antonio, but they are, there's a lot of them. Yeah, I don't know that number. I wish I did. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Why say yes? Well, we uh, we we do collect client surveys, 
And um, part of it is, part of the survey is uh, just to check off, you know, agree, strongly agree, disagree. But part of it is actually asking for information about how they feel about the program and what we could do better. And so um, we have, at this point, we have 100% satisfaction. I can tell you that the, um, that the moms, the comments that they, that they say speak to the therapeutic relationship with the nurse, you believed in me, you, you, you showed that I, you, you taught me that I could do things myself, um, other people didn't believe in me, um, I appreciate the, the education that you brought, um, I wish this program lasted longer, um, what can I link with to another type of family services program? And so um, those are the kind of comments that we get. But thank you very much for that question. I should probably include that because I think that, yes, I think we need WISE and WISE they need to speak together because um, there is a lot about, I agree, there's a lot about anxiety in, in pregnant moms. And, and one of our particular QI projects is working on preterm, decreasing the rate of preterm. Um, birth because um, a lot of our moms suffer from toxic uh, shock and, and environment, toxic stress, I mean, in their environment. And um, I really think that leads a lot to, um, and stress is just such a, such a big issue. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Greeley asked me to step in and um, <laughs> be the moderator for a moment, so I'm going to wear two hats. Um, he left us with two questions for the panel, and um, thinking that we could just kind of pass the microphone. Uh, the first question for each of you is, what is the biggest obstacle to your success in the work that you do? Um, and so this is asking you to wear even more than two hats, but if you want, we can... It's a hard question to answer, I guess. Uh, probably what, what this, we're talking about is, you know, getting programs implemented. And, and, you know, you mentioned it, that it's hard. First, you have to show that the project, the program is beneficial and, and, and how did it improve outcomes. And then once you do that, then you've got to have funding to support it. Um, but that's, that takes time. I mean, it takes a while. And that's why we're here and that's why we're... We, you know, gradually, we, hopefully we can get the right program, get the right fit, um, but it's, it's hard work. So. Um, challenge, one of the challenges is collaboration, and, that, and that's a good challenge because once you do networking kinds of things, then there's a lot of things that you can learn from each other. And, um, and, I, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's a good challenge. One of the biggest challenges, well, it's more than one really, that we struggle with in, in, at our site is uh, uh, community resources in that um, our moms struggle with um, having good affordable childcare so that they don't have to leave their vulnerable child with somebody who's less than able to take care of them. Um, and they're not always a bad guy. They're not always the bad boyfriend who's out of work. Sometimes they are just an elderly grandparent who is too infirmed or too elderly to, to you know, safely take care of a child. So childcare is a big issue. Housing is a big issue um, in Bear County and mental health services. A, a significant number of our, of our moms do struggle with emotional disturbance and a, a part of it may be environmental. It certainly speaks to anxiety even after they have their baby. Let me just speak on behalf of um, being a consumer and the comparison between um, being overseas um, and then being here as well. And in talking with um, other, other moms um, that are friends as well, while there are a, a great services, um, there is a restriction though. Someone such as myself, who's middle class, is not going to be able to access the awesome program that you have available. Um, and I think that those resources need to be available. A challenge is having them available across the board. Because just in comparison, talking to um, an another fellow mom who's same economic status as myself, to find out, let her, letting her know what resources were available to me while I was overseas, she felt that she had n no way of even beginning to understand how do I access those resources? How do I... Create, she had to try to search, you know, to find her own community of other moms, um, kids close in age that she could talk to and relate to. So I think it, to make it a, a global um, initiative is, is one of the challenges um, that's out there. So. 
All right, and I would actually probably piggyback on several things that others have said because in implementing the period of purple crying, we're doing it at two birthing centers within the Seton family of hospitals. And in the US, we're not Canada, we're not New Zealand, we don't have a lot of constant contact with all mothers. We have this little window of time when they're in the hospital giving birth, maybe three days, maybe four days. So we try to do the period of purple crying in the second day, but we're competing. There's so many competing interests. There's so many other needs that those mothers have in that tiny window of time. And it's, it's really, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for the nurses who have so many requirements and so many things on their plate. Um, and it's also funding has been a big challenge because, you know, in, in Canada and New Zealand, the, the need for primary prevention is recognized so fully that the government supports it completely. We don't have that. We have, you know, grant-funded organizations where they're, grunded, uh, they're funded fairly piecemeal. So it, it's a big challenge. Okay, now I'm going to put my moderator hat back on. <laughs> And um, the second question that we're left with is, if you could write one piece of legislation that would maybe support the work that you do, um, what would it be? Um, and <laughs> if, uh, if you don't have thoughts, or if you need to think for a moment, I can start on that one. OK. OK, so actually, there's two pieces of legislation. There's one that we're actually working on at the moment that I spoke about in my talk, you know, trying to get primary um, prevention services for prevention of child abuse available. Um, the other thing that we're promoting in that piece of legislation is increased funding for nurse family partnership and other home visiting nursing organizations, which are just critical in the prevention of child abuse. They've been absolutely phenomenal. I just want to do cartwheels for the nurse family partnership. We've actually been partnering with them in Austin, um, and they've been, yeah, at Any Baby Can, and we love them. Um, but the other piece of legislation that just occurred to me yesterday um, when I spoke with the CPR and first aid um, organization here in San Antonio that, um, that that primary, they were doing the primary prevention, the abuse of head trauma, the period of purple crying, education for foster families and, um, and child care providers and then they stopped. I don't know why they stopped. I, I personally need to look into that further but I think that that would be a critical piece of legislation because it is a huge missed opportunity and I think the more, because child care providers are, are, comprise a significant number of perpetrators um, and that cannot be overlooked. So those would be my bits of legislation. <laughs> I think for me, for um, legislation, is really being able to expand services like what um, you guys provide to um, all economic levels um, and for a longer term to up to age five, if possible. I think that would be fantastic to have. Well, of course, my passion is uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. And um, the Surgeon General, a, a few years ago, there was a task force, and they had um, mandated that we were going to make that a primary issue across the United States, that we were going to address the preterm birth issue. And it was going to be one of the number one um, uh, focused areas, but yet, you know, we need funding. And uh, so that when we decide that we're going to make something that, uh, the emphasis and then how and what area related to that are we going to focus on and the, the funding whether it's for research or whether it's for preventive programs or whether it's whatever it is is going to have to be uh, an aspect of that that comes behind that decision i think that's important the um the children's shelter uh family strengthening department has programs um, uh, an umbrella of programs called the iParent program, and um, and they have no income requirements. Um, there are so so they they pair um, parent educators and those who provide support to work as case managers to help um, families, and they don't have to be first time moms. And so those those programs 
just remind me that there are home visiting programs across the state, and some of them don't have income requirements, and um, but um, they they aren't perhaps as large as Nurse Family Partnership, but they are um, they are um, many of them evidence based curriculum, evidence based programs, and um, promising practices programs that could um, that could help moms in need, families in need. Fragile families, there is no income um, base for fragile families. Sometimes fragile families are, are not low income. And so um, to, to pair up and to, to get more information out, that would be good. But also to fund those other programs, if you're talking about a piece of legislation, to make that something where you can take, if you look across the state of Texas and you see that map, and you see dots where um, there are home visitation programs across the state, there are big gaps big gaps in uh, rural areas, um, uh, for example, the area between San Antonio and Austin, um, you know, the programs can't serve all of those. Um, east towards Seguin, um, there are a lot of areas that, that aren't, um, there aren't programs to serve those people, and those people are isolated and they need support. So, so um, getting that map and opening it up, making the state of Texas purple, but also to, to connect those dots so that um, um, you, you could get some kind of support for families across, I think that would be a really important thing. Okay, so does anybody have any other questions for the panel, any commentary, anything at all that they would like to ask or share? Okay, oh, yeah. Increase public awareness without crisis, such as our football players that are being, or they're being so horrible to where um, family violence is being shown, or even uh, child abuse uh, as uh, covered up by, you know, well, that's my right to discipline. Uh, that's a good word, discipline. My child, is there a way to get the public awareness higher because they would be willing to fund more with awareness rather than just a group like this with people who deal with it all the time? Mm -hmm. And their awareness is high, but they ain't paid enough to fund mm -hmm. what the public could. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone want to tackle that question? I mean, maybe just even from a state standpoint or even a city standpoint, you focus on that and make it something that you just blanket the city or, you know, blanket the state. But, you know, that, and that goes back to like legislation that it's determined that we, you know, there's a week or a month that you blanket the state with information related to that. So you increase awareness. I mean, that, I guess, could be one way. 